Social psychologists have the goal of creating interventions with regard to diversity science. They're typically interested in looking at things with regard to the individual level of analysis. So social psychologists generally are interested in changing beliefs and perceptions and attitudes. And social psychologists also recognize that there are these general beliefs in our society or stereotypes about different groups. And they tend to be pretty pervasive because they're perpetuated through things like social media, television, movies. And so as a result, social psychologists have two sort of overarching or large goals. So the first one is working to reduce bias and unfair treatment. So working to reduce the bias that might result from these stereotypes that our society has. And then second, working to make sure that individuals feel welcome and included and don't feel threatened in different environments. And so as a result, social psychologists are interested then in addressing a variety of really important societal issues. So they're interested in creating higher feelings of inclusion in college campuses. Of, In particular, there's been a lot of work looking at reducing biases and increasing gender and racial diversity in STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. They're also interested in reducing violence towards certain groups and addressing bias in policing, and also in collaboration with nurses and doctors working to address health disparities. So social psychologists, we're really an eclectic group and they're really working to address this issue in a variety of different domains. With regard to evidence-based interventions that have been successful in social psychology, there have been quite a bit, um, those two larger goals. So the goal of reducing bias towards different groups and also working to create more welcoming environments for groups. So with regard to the first goal of reducing bias, there's been a lot of interventions that have been tested in controlled laboratory experiments that have worked to reduce and break those more automatic stereotypes or automatic biases or these general associations that we have between groups and certain traits that, again, are perpetuated on that larger sort of societal level. And so researchers, for example, have shown that exposing people to counter-stereotypical exemplars or group members who don't really fit the stereotype of that group can help reduce more automatic stereotypes or automatic biases. Um, As a result, it's unsurprising that having really quality contact with members of different groups can also decrease prejudice and stereotyping and improve relationships between groups. One thing that's interesting is that this contact doesn't even have to be in person. So even just having virtual contact or feeling like you developed a friendship with a character from a television show or a movie can also have really positive outcomes with regard to bias. In addition, if you just imagine having a positive contact experience, so if I just sort of picture having a positive contact experience in my head, that can also lead to bias reduction. In other work, researchers have found that if you take the perspective of somebody from a different group, so if you you know, try to walk in their shoes, think about what they go through, the struggles they face, feel empathy and sympathy and concern for them, that can also help reduce bias. And then finally, Even when you have a stereotype, so if you have a thought and you think, oh, that was really stereotypical, I shouldn't have thought that, just telling yourself, no, that's wrong, that can actually help reduce bias as well. Um, Other work has also looked at blurring these group boundaries. So instead of thinking as us versus them, thinking of us having a a general overarching group or what they've called a common in-group identity. And so for example, thinking about us being from the same university or in the same company or even from the same country as opposed to separate groups. Those are some techniques that have been really effective at reducing bias generally, but also some of those more automatic stereotypes. Uh, But I did want to make the point that um, some of these effects are really consistent and beneficial, but one of the problems is that they're not long lasting. So for example, if I were to show you a counter-stereotypical exemplar or have you interact with a counter-stereotypic exemplar in the lab, we might see that those effects persist, say, for um, a day or a couple of hours, but then we run into the problem in that you're returning back into the society where these stereotypes exist. And so as a result, if you're not doing anything after that, most likely the bias is gonna return. And so researchers, think as a result, our social psychologists think that it's really important that we help make people aware of their personal biases so they can correct when their behavior, when they've done an unfair behavior. So we 
as social psychologists, want to make people aware of biases in society as well as their own personal biases. And also encourage people to speak out and point out and confront when they see people acting in a discriminatory manner or when they see them acting unfairly. Um, and so as a result, there's actually been some really great work on multi-component interventions in which they start off by raising awareness of this issue. So helping people recognize bias in society, helping people recognize their own personal bias, and then giving them the tools that they need to work on their automatic stereotyping. So telling them, okay, after you're done with this workshop, take the perspective of this, these groups, try to have contact experiences or watch counter stereotypical exemplars in the media. And they found that these multi-component trainings or workshops can actually lead to long-lasting change. So it can make people more aware of their personal biases, lead to reduction in bias. And when they're implemented at a higher level, so say implemented in an organization across multiple people, it can improve organizational climate and actually lead to the hiring of more diverse employees. So there's been some really great work with, but sort of taking everything that we know as social psychologists and putting them together and then validating a workshop from that. So that's been really exciting work. Um, and then with regard to creating more welcoming, so social psychologists wanna reduce bias, but then we also wanna to work to create these more welcoming environments for all groups. And so there's this whole other really great body of work addressing that issue. Um, so some work has found that if you get people to affirm an important value or think about an important aspect of the self or value related to the self that can reduce threat. Within college and high school classrooms, social psychologists have implemented interventions where they promote the message that intelligence or ability can improve and get better or generally promote the message that intelligence is malleable. And another um, classroom intervention Researchers have had students think about how the course content can help improve society and help make life better for um, the students' friends and families. And doing that helps um, Black and Latinx students, as well as first-generation students, or uh, students whose parents didn't go to college, feel more welcome in the university environment. And a similar intervention can help women feel a higher sense of belonging in STEM or the science and technology, engineering and mathematics fields. Other work has found that showing people inspirational role models or people that they feel similar to and aspire to be like can also promote the sense of belonging. Um, so there's been a lot of really great work showing that having women learn about either really successful female leaders or successful female scientists who are also likable and relatable so they can relate to them and feel similar to them can inspire women's interest and sense of belonging in science and in leadership. In somewhat related work, uh, social psychologists have also found that individuals feel, again, that higher sense of belonging, like they feel included and welcome in, in an environment when they're with similar others. So this work has really shown the benefit of having affinity groups or cultural spaces in organizations or in universities. Finally, I want to mention that not just in college classrooms, but say in an organization, they can also promote messages through their websites or their promotional materials that suggest that certain groups will or will not be welcome. So for example, women and underrepresented minorities tend to not feel as welcome in a company when that company says that they don't really value differences. So having a message that says we value diverse perspectives, we value um, differences between groups can help those groups feel more welcome and make them more interested in working in that organization. So one of the biggest challenges is making sure that they actually do get implemented outside of the laboratory. Um, so for example, I might know the best intervention to make all students feel welcome in a college classroom or in a STEM college classroom, but if I can't get instructors to use that intervention, it won't do any good. And so it's really important that we as social psychologists get the word out and make sure that individuals know about our interventions. So for example, videos like this one are really great um, in getting that information out there.